Okay, today what we want to talk about are, are what is often called in the business single particle orbits. And you might say, well, I thought this was a course on plasma physics, and so why are we talking about single particle orbits? Well, and by the way, I should say before, uh, this is actually Chen uh, and Bittencourt, um, chapter, uh, chapter 2, and then Bittencourt, chapters 2, 3, and 4, it turns out, uh, because he uh, deals with it in parts, so to speak, one part in one chapter, uh, next part in uh, next chapter, and so forth. So for the next two to three lectures, uh, there's a little bit of overlap that we'll be going into. We'll be talking about single particles. Now, the reason why we talk about single particle orbits is because we want to be dealing with a plasma, which is going to be made up of a whole bunch of charged particles. And we're later going to have to deal with self-consistent or collective electric and magnetic fields. But what we need to do is first get a feeling for how particles would move if we prescribed the electric field and the magnetic field. So, and so the, the general idea is that, uh, well, and, and secondly, let me say it this way, plasmas are sort of intermediate between a fluid where you use strictly fluid equations like, you know, if you had a liquid or, or gas at, uh, uh, under not too low a pressure and that sort of stuff. Uh, a fluid, um, like, for instance, a liquid or something like that. And um, single particles, for instance, like accelerators. You know, in an accelerator, what we do is we uh, prescribe some electromagnetic fields and accelerate individual particles. And... Uh, in doing so, we can treat it as a problem where we treat only one particle at a time. And our problem in plasma physics is that our particles sort of act more or less individually, but then they also act somewhat collectively as in a fluid type thing. So, uh, you know, it, it's plasma is sort of intermediate between this fluid-like description and a single particle description, and we'll come back to that later. Now, in order to uh, begin to look at uh, single particle orbits then, another constant is, or another comment is, in describing single particle orbits, uh, we will assume uh, that, the magnetic, that the electric field and the magnetic field um, are prescribed or given, and in particular, uh, not collective. We'll come back to collective responses later, but for the moment we want to say, okay, if I have prescribed the electric field, the magnetic field, or certain magnitudes, what do the particle orbits look like? And the general sort of equation of motion uh, for particles is, uh, and I should say non-relativistic, uh, maybe I ought to mention that right now, uh, the idea is that... Um, uh, in most plasmas, we're interested in temperatures, say electron ion temperatures, maybe up to 10 kilovolts, 1, 10 kilovolts, something like that. And that's much less than the rest mass energy, say, of electrons at 511 kilovolts, and certainly much less than the rest mass energy of a, of a proton at, you know, uh, 1 GeV, 10 to the 9th EV. So most of the time, we're quite happy with a non-relativistic non assumption. Now... In general, then, our equation of motion, non-relativistically, is just what you might call F equals MA, good old Newton's law, which we, however, off, most often write as mass times acceleration is equal to the Lorentz force, which is, in fact, then Q, E plus V cross B. So this is fundamentally the equation we've got to somehow determine, look at, uh, um, calculate uh, various particle orbits for. And you can imagine, and, and the, our basic problem is that we can imagine that the electric field and the magnetic field are sort of inhomogeneous in space and various complications, and they may vary in time and so forth and so on. So our way 
of making this discussion, our, our, our way of making it, will be we'll take various cases. Uh, we'll, we'll assume you know, some limit and then we'll add and make it a little more complicated and then just keep working on it and make it more complicated as time goes on. So the first case we would like to do um, is consider the case where we have an electric field, so E is not equal to zero, but on the other hand there's no magnetic field and we will assume um, that the electric field is in fact <coughs> constant in space and time. Well, then our equation is something we can rather easily solve. It's mass times acceleration, mdvdt, is just equal to qe. There's no v cross b. b was zero by assumption. And electric field being constant in time, charge is surely constant in time, uh, at least for all that we're not creating or destroying charge, so we don't have that problem. And so we can just integrate this directly, and we then get that the velocity um, is equal to uh, Q over M times the electric field times time. That's just the direct integral of that, plus some constant of the motion, which we will just choose to call the initial velocity, so just acceleration due to an electric field. And if we uh, realize that V itself is dx dt, the velocity is dx dt, then we integrate once more, and we easily have x is equal to a constant, which we'll choose to be some initial position, plus then v naught t for uniform translation at whatever velocity we had initially, and then plus one half uh, q over m electric field t squared. So the idea is that if we had only an electric field, and no magnetic field, what we would get is uniform acceleration. Does that mean acceleration to infinite velocities and uh, you know things like that? Well, we'd, there'd be some limits on the process, right? Uh, so it would be limited by, it turns out, uh, if our time scale was long compared to some form of collisions, uh, we'd have to take those into account. We'll come back to those. And uh, also relativistic effects. Or radiation effects, or which are effectively relativistic effects, and so forth and so on. So uh, electric field is the simplest case. Uh, unfortunately, it's not the one we get into a lot. But uh, it's just uniform acceleration due to the electric field and, you know, uh, all of this, of course, is just the acceleration per unit mass. So this is a very standard formula. Okay, so next what we're going to go on to is the opposite, which is to say zero electric field but with a magnetic field. And this is a, a paradigm or typical um, thing that we'll be interested in, in in some detail. And so this case is the electric field is equal to zero, but the magnetic field does not equal zero. Again, we're taking a cop out. Um, we're going to say that the magnetic field is in fact constant, or some people use the word uniform. And this will lead to, okay, uh, what's uh, parallel motion along the magnetic field, which will be unimpeded and more or less like the preceding case. Uh, plus gyro motion, but we'll explain what we mean by that in just a moment here. So now for this particular case, our F equals MA equation becomes mass times acceleration is equal to the Lorentz force, no electric field, only magnetic field, so it's Q V cross B. Okay? Now, if you look at that, uh, if I take the parallel to B component, okay, the part, and so, well, I'm going to need in a little while to draw a magnetic field geometry, but I won't, well, I won't do that just yet. But, but anyway, uh, we can see that we're going to have something going on parallel to the magnetic field, where if we take the parallel or B dot this, B dot this will give me the parallel acceleration, and B dot this will give me B dot V cross B, 
So that'll actually give me zero. So parallel is going to be different, is, is the way to say it, from perpendicular. So what we find it convenient to do is define that the velocity is going to be a parallel velocity plus a perpendicular, and then we'll treat the two cases uh, somewhat differently. Now, how do I define parallel, and how do I define perpendicular? Well, we're going to need to do this uh, a good bit, so uh, off and on in the course in many different contexts. So we're going to do a sort of side calculation. Sometimes I'll do side calculations this way. And the basic idea is we want to use what's called the, the good old back cab rule. Namely, if I have a vector and I cross it with the cross product of two other vectors, that is to say A cross B cross C, the back cab rule says that this is B in the direction B, A dot C, that scalar, minus uh, cab C, A dot B. So this is called the back, for this business, cab rule. All you have to remember is the fact that, um, is that the, the first letter here represents the vectorial direction, and the other two represent the, the part that's supposed to be the dot product. Okay? Now, how is that useful to us? Well, let's suppose that we took B cross B cross C. Yeah. That is to say, we took B cross B, uh, B cross C. Some C is some vector, and B is now going to be the magnetic field for B equals magnetic field. If we do this, then B cross B cross C, using the back cab rule, but realizing that our B here is the A, okay? First, we end up with B times B dot C. Hopefully, I got that right. <laughs> uh, and then minus C A dot B, so it's minus C B dot B. Um, now, b dot b is just scalar product b squared. And uh, so this sort of looks like g. It's almost in the, uh, you know, it is the c itself, but times b squared. So we can then write this as minus, uh, let me make it b squared c vector times, uh, I'm sorry, we need to have the times out here. And then, I'm going to put this other one inside, and if I do that, then it becomes minus b, b dot c, divided by b squared. So what this tells us then, b dot c, I could call that, or define it, as b c parallel because it is the component of C in the direction of B, whatever that is. And then, so this would be basically C minus C parallel in the direction of B. So I could, this thing would turn out to be then V perp. So what we find out of this, just looking at the various pieces of this, is that we would be inclined to define a C parallel vector as b vector b dot c over b squared, which we could also write as b vector over b c parallel scalar, which means this, this has become b c parallel. And we would also write c perp, the perpendicular part of that vector, as uh, now, all, all of this stuff in parentheses then, I should have done a little bit more in here, would be defined as C perp because it's the total vector minus its parallel component. So it turns out that would be written as minus 1 over B squared B cross B cross C. And then our total vector C, if you just then put these pieces back together would then be then C parallel plus C perp. 
So for the application that I have in mind here, I have some arbitrary velocity v, and I would like to pick out its parallel component. And clearly from this, we have that v parallel vector will then be just b vector over b times b dot uh, v, and then I have to have b squared to get the right dimensionality here. And v perp will be equal to minus, minus just because of the b cross b cross signedness, but anyway, b cross b cross v divided by b squared. So the idea then is that we can split any vector v into its components along the magnetic field and its components perpendicular to the magnetic field. Um, and now some people also, and, and me in particular, often write a little b as b vector over b, and that will be a unit vector along the magnetic field. And if I use that, then I can just write this as v parallel b vector and this v perp as minus b cross b cross v, uh, which is sometimes a little bit more convenient way to do that. Okay, the, the, so to review what we're trying to say here is that any vector c can be broken into its parallel and perpendicular components with respect to some other vector that some other vector we're interested in is the magnetic field B, and, and this is the mechanics of how we make that split. Okay, what good does that do us? Well, what good it does is, if, is we now go back to F equals MA, and we want to extract the parallel to the magnetic field component and the perpendicular component. So uh, we shall uh, do that. Uh, so again, we're still working on this with a, like, with a magnetic field but no electric field. Um, so, obviously then if we have dv dt and the v has both parallel and perpendicular components, then you can just write this as dv perp by dt plus dv parallel by dt. But since the magnetic field is, is a constant, uh, that's no real problem. Uh, I mean, we can take the d by dt's operating on the b's won't give us anything. Later, when we have inhomogeneous fields, this will become a little bit more complicated. Uh, so this will be equal to Q V cross B. Actually, I should have put a mass on here. So it's Q over M mass or acceleration per unit mass, force per unit mass, sorry. Okay. Now, so if we take the B or B dot, that is to say the parallel component of this equation. So again, now what we have found by these things is that if we want the parallel component of something, we take the, the B dot, you know, the, the component of it in the direction of the magnetic field, or B. So if we do that, we take B dot, then we're, we're going to get out of this, you know, just dV parallel, the scalar dt, is equal to and what is b dot v cross b? Well, we know that we've got, you know, b dot any vector a cross b is equal to zero, right? Because this says take its cross, but then the dot in that particular product is always zero. So actually, this is zero. Um, what that says, we can then solve that equation, and that says that v parallel is equal to v parallel naught equals a constant. So if the particle had a certain velocity v parallel naught initially along the magnetic field, it will continue to have that velocity. It will just, you know, go along, translate along at constant velocity. And um, it turns out we're going to use the, uh, eventually that the magnetic field is going to be in the z direction. So if I integrate this once more, uh, we'll call this dz dt. Okay, v parallel is dz dt. Um, and so if I integrate once more, I will just get that the particle position along the magnetic field will be z is equal to z naught 
plus v parallel naught t, which is just uniform translation or motion along the magnetic field. So that one's easy. Uh, that's just the same as the preceding problem with the electric field, except that we don't have any acceleration, so it's gotten even simpler. Um, now, that only got took care of the easy part of this equation, which is the parallel part. Now we'd like to go into the perpendicular part. And how do we get perpendicular? Well, to get perpendicular, what we do is we take minus b cross b cross v. Okay? So let's take minus b cross b cross the equation. Okay? And then we'll pick up only perpendicular components. So what we do is we do minus b cross b cross. And what we're doing it of is this uh, equation up here. And what does that give us? Well, v perp will just be v perp because it's already perp. And so, you know, when I take its perpendicular component, I'll just get that back. But v parallel was, was in the direction of b. So b cross b will be 0. So there's no v parallel. And this will then be equal to q over m v perp, actually, cross b. <laughs> if I had a v parallel in here, v parallel is in the direction of b, and that would be, you know, I could have simplified this already, that if I put in here the v is equal to v perp plus v parallel, the parallel is parallel to b, and so b cross b would be 0. So, you know, I wouldn't have needed that anyway. Okay, so this is the equation of motion perpendicular. I'll do a little mathematics, a little more mathematics here, and then we'll sketch it and so we can see what, really what's going on. Now, uh, in the same sense that all other velocities, uh, you know, we would like to say is the time derivative of some spatial position. So let's say that uh, v perp is going to be the time derivative of some perpendicular position, the r perp dt. Well, if we do that, and then we take our equation, okay, and we integrate it over time, then what we will end up with on the left-hand side is v perp, okay, and on the right-hand side we'll be have we'll have q over m. Now the v perp uh, now will become uh, an r perp. So we're going to integrate dr perp dt. But in addition, um, there's, there's maybe a, a constant of integration of this whole equation, and I'm going to simply choose that constant to be something I'll call r perp naught. And we'll see what that is in a moment. And then this is cross b. By the way, I should say Chen has a more Cartesian way of working, about working this out, and we'll go into Cartesian coordinates and work it out simply in a moment. But I, I want to show you this vectorial stuff has, has usefulness for later is kind of what I would say. Okay, so um, uh, now uh, again we end up with um, a little bit of problem here. Let me just kind of say we'd like to have not an equation for v perp in terms of r perp. This was just the integral of that, time integral of that equation. But we'd rather know what r perp is in terms of v perp. You know, our uniform translation is z is equal to z plus vt. So we'd like to have, you know, r perp is v perp, something like that. So how do we do that? Well, how we do it is we, uh, we need to cross something with this so as to, uh, to, to undo that. And the way we do that is we take... Um, see which way I want to take it, but, um, uh, okay, well, let's do it this way and then we'll come back. Uh, anyway, so we'll take B cross this equation and that will give us M, I, I'm going to take the Q over M over at the other side as well. Um, QB or MC. Uh, 
I'm just a little bit confused about how I want to do this for a moment. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, right. Okay, I'll, uh, I guess I want to do one other thing. Sorry, before I want to do that. Um, what I want to do is define another vector here. Um, this is a velocity, and this is a position. So a velocity to a position, I need a frequency, okay, to, to make the, the dimensionality of all this come out right. So what we find convenient to do is to define a cyclotron frequency. And it is, if you do this stuff up right, let me say it that way, you actually find that it, and for reasons that I'll mention in a moment, you should define omega c, which is a cyclotron vector, is minus qb over m, such that then the scalar omega c will just be the absolute value of q over m. Remember here, q is the charge of a species, ions, protons, or electrons, and the electrons have a negative charge. So, uh, and, and this minus sign indicates a direction of rotation. So with that being the case, I can then make this is uh, r perp minus r perp naught cross minus omega c, okay? But I can simplify that by any cross product. If I switch its order, I make it negative instead of positive. So I can then change, so it would have been, let me do it over here, I guess. Uh, it would have been r perp minus r perp naught cross minus omega c. That's going to be a little bit hard to read. So when we change the order, it then becomes omega c cross r perp minus r perp naught. Now, in this form, then I'm finally ready to cross it using my friendly back cab rule with omega sub c. Okay? Omega sub c is just another vector. A, B, C, omega sub c, who cares what they are, you know? So let's do that. So I'll, I'll write my equation back here at the top, uh, namely V perp um, is going to be equal to omega sub c cross R perp minus R perp naught. And then what I'd like to do is take, um, um, hmm. sorry, what? Oh, yeah. Just leave it up there for a while. Yeah. Uh, the only part is the part that gets kind of hard to see off to the right-hand side here. <laughs> uh, so hopefully I could have just recopied the equation. Now what I want to do is cross this with omega sub c. And I want to use this back cab rule. So I'll get omega sub c cross uh, v perp is equal to omega sub c. This is a little more complicated than we really would like to be at this moment, but it's kind of fun. So anyway, r perp minus r perp naught. Good exercise in vector analysis, OK? Now, remember when we had, we played our little back cab rule over here a minute ago. And the moral to that story was if we had b, b cross b cross c, we ended up with minus b squared times the perpendicular component of that vector, whatever that vector was. So using that same um, uh, structure here, can't quite get both, on, well, I can get it on this way. Okay. What we can say is this is minus, the vector is now not b, but it's omega sub c squared. And the, the C is not C, but it's this R perp minus R perp naught. Now, I already had the perp, so I don't need a perp perp. You know, you know I mean, it was already a perpendicular vector anyway. Okay, so if I want uh, R perp, then, you know, I better divide through by omega C squared. And then secondly, I take a minus sign over here and flip sign. So all, all of this then ends up giving me that r perp is equal to r perp naught. It's plus because I was clever at choosing the sign earlier, right? And then plus, 
and now I have to switch the order of this so it v becomes v perp cross omega sub c and all of this becomes omega sub c squared. So that's our um, uh, gyro motion, it turns out, formula, and we'll, we'll sketch that in a moment. And often it's convenient to define this as plus, and Chen uses a, a notation r sub c, uh, but I will use the notation rho, and the magnitude of this Oh, I'm sorry. I went down too far. That's right. Sorry. Yeah. I always forget about that, right? <laughs> so we can define the magnitude of the gyro radius. So this is called often called the gyro radius for moments. Reasons will be clear in a moment here, hopefully. So the gyro radius rho is the magnitude of this vector. But the magnitude is just going to be v perp over omega sub c. Okay? Now let's sketch this, and then we'll come back over here and uh, do some uh, mathematics or uh, do some estimating of how big a gyro radius would be and so forth. But let's uh, sketch things a bit here. Okay, to sketch things, I need another pen. Um, what we have in mind is that uh, I'm going to have some generalized coordinate system here for a moment. And as I said, we're going to choose the magnetic field to be in the z direction. And so we better have, uh, let's see, I guess an, an x up in this direction and a y down in this direction. And then what we're going to imagine is that we have a, a uniform magnetic field in the z direction. So let's imagine we have a bunch of magnetic field lines. Are magnetic field lines real, of course? How about no, but they're very convenient. We, we think of them as being real, uh, and particularly, it turns out, in plasma physics, we really like to think about magnetic field lines. Um, so, you know, it's sort of you follow the magnetic field, and you're effectively following a line. So these are our magnetic field lines. Now, in our definitions here, um, a moment ago, we said that we would like to define this cyclotron frequency as, in fact, minus... Q B vector over M. Well, that being the case, the kind of first thing I want to do is I want to uh, be more specific here, and I want to say that we're going to treat an ion, and for that, Q is equal to plus E. So what that is going to mean is that, in fact, uh, this omega C vector, this cyclotron frequency vector, is going to be not in the direction of B, but is actually the opposite direction. So I can draw myself a vector omega sub C. Now, what we need to do is to go back and, and think about our, our particle motion. Um, so we go back a couple of slides here. And we had that... Um, Sorry, the bottom of this is, I guess, what I want. Yeah, if you don't mind handing it back, I might need it <laughs> a little bit here. Yes, I will in a moment. Okay, so what this tells us, namely the equation, the acceleration is uh, omega c cross b, or minus, actually. We could have written that out as uh, um, this will be v perp cross omega sub c or it'll be omega sub c cross v perp. And so if you think about this vectorially, what it says is use one of these good old right-hand rules, and it says stick your thumb along the direction of the vector, and the direction of motion will, in fact, be uh, around that. Okay? So the, the motion is here uh, around in this direction, and that actually will give us uh, cyclotron motion uh, if you work that out. So the net result of this, then, is that the fact that you have the acceleration in the direction perpendicular to both your present velocity direction and the direction of the magnetic field, or the negative of that direction, means that, in fact, if I can imagine that you know my particle center is about here, uh, gyro center, we'll call it in a moment, and so 
we'll end up with, let's do it like this. The particle motion is, in fact, um, I'm trying to indicate by dotted those things which are behind the plane. And so the particle, let's say, has a V perp in this direction. Then if we go back, uh, let's just choose it to have that. We're considering a particle at this particular mo time that has that particular position or velocity. Then if we go back to our single particle orbit, which we calculated, which was this uh, r perp is equal to r perp naught, some initial position, or, or actually guiding center position, we'll call it in a moment, uh, time plus v perp cross omega sub c. Uh, if you kind of go through the mathematics of that, what you'll see is that r perp naught, can't get my lines straight here. Anyway, this will be r perp naught, and that actually will be our so-called guiding center, or it's the center of this orbit. And then this vector here will be the rho, or this gyro motion uh, vector. And then our present position, r perp, then our present position is the sum of this position to the center of this circle of the particle as it actually it should be <laughs> should run this way as the particle gyrates around the field line okay and so there's a center a guiding center it's called so this is called the this particular position let me do it in a different color so we'll be able to tell that it's something a little different so this is called the guiding center, that big position right there. So the idea is that the particle is actually gyrating around the field line, okay? But in addition, it's going to move along the field line. You remember, it, so it's, it, the field line's like this, and the particle's gyrating around it, but it's also moving along the field line. So often we don't try to, we don't speak of the particle total particle motion, including this gyro motion, but we speak only of the gyro motion, which is you know there is this circle here of this particle going around in a gyro motion, and it's just moving along the field line. Okay, that little loop is moving along the field line. Now a couple things to keep track of: which direction does the particle gyrate? Okay. The first is that it's gyrating with a sense that would be right-handed if you were moving opposite to the direction of the B field, it turns out. That's what this omega C being in the negative direction is. So it turns out an ion with Q positive then has a left-handed uh, uh, rotation as I look along the field line, not right-handed. Q negative electrons have a right-handedness. Now, if you think about that, that says that as the particle goes around the field line, it'll create a little current. Okay? And that current will always be, whether it's for ions or electrons, so as to cancel off some of the magnetic field I've got. So a plasma is actually diamagnetic. It tries, by virtue of the particle, the charged particle motions, they gyrate around the field line in such a direction so as to reduce the magnetic field, hence uh, a plasma, the particles in a plasma uh, have a diamagnetic effect on the magnetic field, not paramagnetic. They don't add to it, they subtract from it. Okay, we need to get back, uh, before I forget it, to, um, to talking about some magnitudes of this gyro motion around the field line. You know, how big is that gyro radius? Well, we're going, we, we took before that we had a magnetic field of the order of one Tesla. Uh, kind of illegible, so we'll try one Tesla. And we also had, uh, or we didn't have, but I will choose, let's say, an ion temperature on the order of, say, 500 electron volts. This is kind of typical for some the uh, tokamak plasma over in uh, Phaedrus T or the MST plasma over in the physics department. Uh, you know, there'll be sort of these types of parameters, roughly speaking. 
So we'd like to know how big is the gyro radius, you know, meters, kilometers, centimeters, something like that. Well, the first thing we have to calculate is V perp. And I really, I, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll start another page here on this. So the question we're into now, um, so how big is the gyro radius? So in magnitude, rho is equal to V perp over omega sub C. Well, first we've got to we got to calculate both V perp and omega sub C. And for simplicity, I'm going to say that we have one Tesla and an ion temperature of about 500 eV. Now, um, let's do it for ions. Uh, we'll do electrons in a moment here. For ions, uh, let's try V perp first. Well, V perp would be the square root, you know, I'd have E perp, perpendicular energy, would be mv perp squared over 2. Uh, and I could imagine this was like the temperature. Okay, We'll come back to defining temperatures in detail later, but you know, this sort of some average energy, some temperature in the plasma, something like that. So I can invert that to say this would be 2t over m. Okay. Now you can calculate this in EV. And you can calculate uh, the mass in ergs. Well, first, you have to convert EV to uh, joules, and then the mass you have to write in kilograms and all that sort of stuff. But you can simplify all this by saying, well, suppose we made it in terms of the velocity of light, c squared, and we'll put a c up here. So then all we have to measure is the temperature relative to the mass in EV, or its rest mass energy in EV, right? then you know, we'll have EV over EV and a velocity of light. So it's a, it's a fraction of the velocity of light given by the kinetic temperature divided by the rest mass energy. And the 2 comes from that 2 in there. Okay. So what do we have? I'll show you why it's so easy to choose 500 EV. So if we have 2 times 500 EV, what's the rest mass energy of a proton? Maybe I should have said also we're going to do a proton here. Well, in round numbers, it's 938 MeV or something like that. But, you know, we're in plasma physics, so that's 10 to the 9th EV, okay? And the velocity of light in MKS units, 310 to the 8th meters a second, right? So that's 10 to the 3 over 10 to the 9. And, of course, we choose things so we can do them. And so that's 10 to the minus 6. Square root of 10 to the minus 6 is 10 to the minus 3. And so this becomes approximately 3 times 10 to the fifth meters per second. Okay. So that's our V burp. Uh, moving pretty far, pretty fast, right? So, you know, one second, uh, 300 kilometers, that's moving pretty well. Going to move a long range, long way in this gyro motion, right? Well, don't be so sure, it turns out. Okay, omega sub c we need is qb magnitude QB over M. And uh, what's the charge? Well, that's good old 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19th coulombs, right? And what's the mass of an ion? 1.67 times 10 to the minus, now we have to use it because in real uh, kilograms, okay? So it's minus 27th uh, kilograms. B, we say, said, was one tesla. And now the virtue, of course, of using MKS units is that all this comes out right, okay? Well, this is, actually, I wrote it down in slightly more accurate form here, so I'll write it down. This is 0.959 uh, times 10 to the 8th, but I'm just as happy to leave out the 0.5959 and call it 10 to the 8th, okay? So the net result of this is that the ion gyro radius is equal to, you know, V perp ion divided by omega sub C ion, okay? So um, this is then uh, 3 times 10 to the 5th divided by 10 to the 8th. And so this thing's moving awfully fast, but it's getting twisted by the magnetic field into the gyro motion 
even faster in some sense. This is, by the way, seconds to the minus 1. And so it turns out this is about, this is 3 times 10 to the minus fifth, uh, third meters. And meters I don't have as good a feeling for, so let's make this as equal to, it turns out, 0.3 centimeters. Okay? So in fact, it may be moving awfully fast, but it's getting turned even faster. And so for our sort of typical plasma here, we're talking about a few tenths of a centimeter ion gyro radius. So these particles are making, you know, around the field line, just really little, little tight spirals. Um, what about electrons? What about electrons? Well, let's suppose that Te is of order Ti. Then the perpendicular velocity of electrons is, you know, it's going to be 2 Te over Me c squared times c. And so it's 1 over the square root of the electron mass. So it's over the order of, okay, Mi over Me times the ion mass, ion velocity. Now, how big is the square root of the ion to electron mass ratio? Well, that's the square root of 1,836, right? And everybody in plasma physics knows that that number is 42.85. But uh, for plasma approximations, we usually make this 43 times V per pi. So the electrons are moving heck of a lot faster, 43 times faster than ions. And so some people say electrons got long legs, run real fast. Ions are short, squat, heavy little guys, and they run real slow. And uh, we'll, we'll have various analogies to that as time goes on. Okay, what about the electron psychotron frequency? Well, remember that's EB over ME, right? So this is going to be proportional to MI over ME times omega CI, the mass ratio itself. So that's 1,836 times omega CI. So what's the electron gyro radius going to do? Well, it's V perp E over omega CE, and I want to just compare it to ions by this. So it's moving a heck of a lot 